PSYOP operations historically can be very simple, you know, throwing leaflets out of the back of an airplane or incredibly elaborate and targeted like at one specific person and literally trying to create a world for them in order to get them to believe something that you want them to believe. That sounds a lot like social media right now. Bingo. The mind is something that can be programmed like a computer yeah. that you can write yeah. memory to, mm -hmm. that you can delete memory from. If the mind functions like a computer, then you should be able to control it like a computer. In the CIA, the magician on staff was a guy named John Mulholland. The other thing that Mulholland did for the CIA was to investigate UFOs, right? So, oh, okay. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't expecting no, no, here. So this, this, okay. this is where... Welcome to Doom Scroll. I'm your host, Joshua Citarella. My guest is artist and geographer Trevor Paglin. He joins me to discuss psychological operations, the mimetic power of UFOs, and the role of magic in shaping our perceptions of the world. You have the Korean War happening, and the North Koreans are taking prisoners. You know, the pilots are shot down, people are captured on the battlefield. And you see the emergence of a new form of media, which is like the hostage video or like the confessional letter, that sort of thing. So you start to get this genre of films coming out of POWs denouncing their war crimes. And the question for intelligence agencies in particular and the kind of policymakers in general is like, why is this happening? What they posit as an answer to that is these prisoners must be being brainwashed by kind of secret Chinese forces. They start to imagine that the, you know, communists or whatever have some kind of mind control program mm. or brainwashing program. Mm. So the CIA initiates like a program, I'm sure many of your listeners have heard of, called MK Ultra, which is to try to figure out how do you manipulate people's minds? How do you interrogate people effectively? How do you resist interrogation effectively, et cetera? But it's a very wide ranging program. Research into the use of hallucinogenic drugs, has research into things like hypnosis, parapsychology, um, they had a magician on staff. They were funding early work. Like in, a rabbit in the hat? Like Yeah, this, magician, that, this is a whole, yeah, yeah. So this is a rabbit okay. hole we should go down because okay. like weirdly magic is a huge part of this story okay. as well. <laughs> That's a side quest. Uh, yeah, I'm listening, one. I'm listening. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, they're doing magic, early work on AI, they're doing work on brain computer interfaces. So they're, you know, funding people to, you know, put electrodes in the minds of like animals and see whether you can control them. You know, a lot of work on interrogations, that sort of thing. Kind of loosely based on the kind of AI conception of the mind where like that, the AI is something that can be programmed. The mind is something that can be programmed like a computer yeah. that you can write yeah. memory to, mm -hmm. that you can delete memory from, et cetera. Mm. And if the mind, functions like a computer, then you should be able to control it like a computer. Mind hacking, I yeah. guess, for, for lack of a better yeah, word. Yeah, mind hacking is this kind of connective link that it's a, a philosophical approach to, uh, we use the word reprogramming, exactly. for example, exactly. right? It's from the philosophy of computers, of computation, and then we extend that to the mind and then look to program people to carry out objectives and so on like they were an app. Exactly. Essentially. Exactly. Yeah. The, and so there, there's a theory of media here yes, as well. Like yes. There's a theory of mind, but there's a theory of media. And it's really different than the theory of media that you would have learned if you did a PhD in media studies, for example. Right? It's really different than semiotics. It's really yeah. different than comp lit or you know, deconstruction or these kind of basic tools that you use in the academy. The one thing I think is important to mention also here is that for people who are not familiar with programs like MK Ultra, you brought us through a lot of history and pretty expansive fields, right? Yeah, we're talking yeah. about computers, we're talking about magicians, we're talking about drugs. Yeah. We know all of that from a minority of the documents that were made public yeah. because the majority of them were actually burned at the end of the program. So as fucking crazy as that sounds, it's gotta be so much worse. If that's the stuff we know, yeah. Yeah. if that's the stuff we know, yeah, yeah it's, um, it's a, a fascinating rabbit hole to go down that uh, in many cases could actually ruin your life if you do it too far. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a trail of bodies behind that. That's a, a research yeah, actually, agenda. Literally. Sure. literally yeah, yeah, literally. And they, you know, 
the other thing to kind of keep in mind here, though, like you know, the 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 golden age or whatever of, of MK Ultra is the '50s and '60s. Yeah, and what the CIA meant then is very different than what it means now, right? So this is pre Watergate. This is mm. pre you know the church hearings and that sort of thing. The CIA was an organization that really came out of like Ivy League schools, right? These are not Cretans. These are people that are interested in modernist literature and poetry and that sort mm. of stuff. And so it didn't have the same kind of cultural signifiers associated with it that it does now. And so when you look at something like MK Ultra and you look at who's funded by it, it's every neuroscientist, it's every <laughs> psychologist, you know, who is happily kind of contributing. You know, I'm a, to I'm a big stuff. proponent for public funding of the <laughs> arts, but <laughs> exactly. if it comes from the CIA, I might have to think, I might have to think twice. What kind of resume does one have to put together? to become the on-staff MK Ultra magician? Is it like, well, I do 12-year-old uh, birthday parties, <laughs> I, do, I do corporate events, and um, yeah, I could probably do some mind control for you guys also. <laughs> How does, <laughs> what, what involvement does uh, MK Ultra have with literal rabbit-in-the-hat card trick magicians? It's actually super interesting, right? Um, so when you look at this, mind hacking, for lack of a better word, as a form of media, and you look at who's really nailed that, it's magicians, mm. right? And when you look mm. at the history of magic and the craft of magic and the media of magic, what it's all about is understanding how somebody else's perception works and what the kind of features and foibles and quirks of that perception are in order to deploy an attack or to stage something that is taking advantage of the deficiencies or quirks of somebody's perception system, right? Mm -hmm. So magicians talk about, you know, attention is a huge part of it. You know, if you're, you know, we've all seen the video of the basketball players, you know, passing the basketball around and the, the, the monkey appears in the middle of the basket court, ball court, and you don't see it because you're busy watching the basketball right, being passed right. around. So yeah. that's an example mm -hmm. of, of something that magicians have known for thousands of years, right? It's like, how do you use the gaps in somebody's attention or perception in order to insert, you know, what, what I think of as a kind of injection attack into somebody's perceptual hmm. system, right? Hmm. And so it is a kind of prototype of this, you know, cognitive warfare or cognitive media or what have you, that's not assuming signification. It's assuming an understanding of how somebody's brain is going to react to different kinds of stimuli and taking advantage of that, right? In the CIA, the magician on staff was a guy named John Mulholland, who was a very prominent uh, magician in the early 20th century. He was like friends with Houdini. He wrote several books about magic. He was the editor of the main you know, journal for, for the magicians, and it was called The Sphinx. And he was friends with a, a series of um, psychologists living in New York City who recruited him to work for the CIA. And he sort of uh. made a public showing of like, oh, I'm getting old, I'm gonna retire. So he kind of shut down a lot of his public operations and took on this kind of covert uh, role mm. at CIA. And at CIA, he did a couple of things. Um, he wrote for them a manual about how to use techniques from magic tricks in order to conduct covert operations. So, you know, in magic, you have things like, you know, how do you make the assistant disappear in the box? Or, you know, how do you, you know, hide the flowers in a hat or whatever it is? And so he was trying to adopt a lot of those techniques to um, covert operations. The second thing he did was, you know, related to that designing weapons for the CIA that looked like other things. So one of the, his most famous inventions was a coin, a silver dollar that had a spike of really deadly poison in it. And the, the, the theory of media there is that you make something innocuous, like a coin. If I see a coin in, in my field of vision, I'm not going to pay attention to it, my mind is going to throw that out instantly. It's like, mm. I know what that is, that mm -hmm. goes away. It's not, there's nothing, nothing interesting here. 
Interestingly enough, in 1960, a U-2 pilot, a spy, a spy plane pilot named Gary Powers, is shot down over the Soviet Union and captured. And in, in his pocket, he has one of these no John way. Mulholland's poison spike coins, which was not found by his captors precisely because it didn't look like a gun or anything like that. Yeah. I think he later had to show it to them and say, hey, look, this coin's actually a weapon. Don't touch it. <laughs> you know? So there's these kind of histories there. The other thing that Mulholland did for the CIA was to investigate UFOs, right? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the, I, was, I wasn't expecting no, you know, here, so this, this, okay. this is where you, these histories are, sound in, like take conspiracy <laughs> theories because they're, they're that weird, well, right? And so, okay. I mean, this is why this is such, to me, this feels like such He a, investigated UFOs for them. Were the UFOs, in this case, aliens, or was it the Soviets, or was it they didn't know what it was? They didn't know what it was. And so what happened in the early 1950s is that there was a series of UFO sightings over Washington, D.C. Some comes called yes. like the Washington, D.C. sightings. Right. And a series of sightings, I think pilots saw things flying over the Capitol. They were seen on radar, this kind of thing. And so that sort of spooked the CIA and they kind of put a panel together to investigate, to figure out whether there was a threat there. Yeah. And what it was called the Robertson panel. What they concluded was that there was not a military threat, but there was a psychological threat. In other words, like that the UFO had enough power as a meme that it could mm. be deployed in broader context of warfare to, you know, do, you know, stage some kind of disinformation operation or some kind of false flag operation, what have you. And also the inverse of that, where they concluded that this was potentially a very good tool for doing psyops right. as well. Right. So with Mulholland, because he had a background understanding how things like magic work, and he'd also written a book where he debunked different uh, parapsychological phenomena mm -hmm. like, you know, mediums and, you know, seances and th this kind of stuff. And so they kind of trusted him as a kind of bullshit filter for, for lack right. of a better word right. for this kind of thing. And I think that that's why they had him go and, you know, investigate these UFOs. Most famously, he investigated one in uh, Kentucky, I think, where a family was holed up in a farmhouse and they said a flying saucer landed and looked like like goblin creatures came out and attacked them. Um, it's the origin of the phrase little green men, you know, comes, okay. From, <laughs> okay. comes from this incident in Kentucky that Mulholland investigated. But he, he investigated other uh, parapsychological phenomena for the CIA as well, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, they were interested in ESP and, you know, telekinesis and this kind of stuff. And he investigated some of that stuff as well. I'm just going to grab a hole on magic for a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, so in magic, again, I'm not, I'm not a historian of this. I'm not, I don't know much about it, but my kind of pedestrian understanding of it is that there's kind of two camps. Hmm. One is we might broadly call it stage magic, you know, people doing tricks and, you know, kind of creating the performance of impossible things. And then there's another strand that, most associated probably with Aleister Crowley, with magic with right. a CK, yeah. right? And I, there's a philosophical divide between the two that I think is really interesting and maybe way too much of a rabbit hole for, for this, but let's go there anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the stage magic is the, is the tradition that Mulholland came out of. And the, the kind of paradigm of it is that you're trying to figure out the quirks of people's perceptions in order to make impossible things appear to happen. And, and they, they really do use this language of truth and false. And they, they talk very explicitly like, we are going to deceive your perceptual apparatus to make you perceive something that is not true, hmm. right? So there still is this binary between you know, reality and the unreality that they create. The Aleister Crowley tradition has a different kind of metaphysical underpinning, which is that it, the assumption is we cannot know reality other than through our perceptions of it, 
like whatever reality is, we don't know what it is. We can get it only mediated through, you know, our senses or through our logic or intellect or instruments that we develop, et cetera. So reality is effectively equivalent to our perceptions of reality, right? Um, in, a, in a practical matter. Therefore, if we are able to alter our perceptions of reality, we are in effect altering reality itself, right? right. And right. so that's, it's a much stronger claim that, and there is no dichotomy between what's true and what's false in that claim. And that to me is an interesting claim vis-a-vis -vis this insane world of AI and social media and, and that, that sort of thing that, uh, that I know you're really interested in. The breakdown of consensus reality mm -hmm. is entirely sympathetic with what you just described yeah where yes individual people are manifesting they're extending their will out into the world they're shaping reality um, all of which is totally antithetical to any historical materialist interpretation of the world uh, and never the tween shall meet mm -hmm. the title of your recent exhibition at pace gallery was you've just been by psyops mm -hmm. is that a real thing or a meme that's a really good question. I got interested in that phrase like many years ago when I found a challenge coin um, purportedly from like what was then called MISO, like the Military Information Support Operations, which was a rebranding of PSYOP that, that kind of went back. Anyway, I've collected challenge coins and patches and kind of the insignia and um, visual culture of weird military units for a very long time. And this is a challenge coin that just had a skull on it and it had like the swirly kind of brainwash eyes and, and weird, you know, vapors or lightning bolts emanating from the skull. And then the slogan around the coin said, you've just been fucked by psyops because physical wounds heal. And, you know, <laughs> and I'm used so, to seeing this as a meme yeah. with an anime character <laughs> and a, a bullet through the brain. Is yeah. that's okay. I've seen that, but I want to yeah. say, your your history with this goes back way further. I started seeing that, I don't know, in like 2022, it was really popular or something. It seems like it's actually relatively recent in the memosphere. Yeah, it's but, recent in the memosphere. It's it's older in the, in the and, military. But how, how, so how far back would Miso be using a phrase like this? So in that mm -hmm. history, you know, traditionally psychological operations were called PSYOP. Mm -hmm. They changed the name to Miso, I think the late 2010s, because PSYOP sounded too nefarious. Some general, saw, they did this from time to time, some general saw it and was like, oh, this feels like demonic and we're like manipulating people's minds. So they changed the name to Miso and then all the troops kind of rebelled, <laughs> you know, and they said, we don't want to be named after like the soup. Uh, <laughs> you know? And so they sort of forced the leadership to change the name back to PSYOP. <laughs> but this, this coin came out of, out of that moment when it would, had been rebranded as MISO. And maybe the, the, the aggressiveness of that logo came as a reaction to having been rebranded MISO by the, by the you know, leadership. It is a uh, tremendously fearsome logo. I uh, was at the exhibition in New York. I also got to see it in Berlin, and it is a uh, terrifying uh, skull. Tell us, uh, what, is, what is the show about? You've just been fucked by PSYOPs. Okay, there, there's a long answer. and um, We like long answers. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I often get criticized as an artist because there's a lot of information around the work and a lot of thought around it. And it's not always obvious, like when you go and you're looking at something, what it is that you're seeing, which for me is the point, but, um, but it can be difficult. So the show came out of me trying to think about where media is going, like looking at emerging forms of media, you know, whether that's AI or recommendation algorithms or kind of looking at a cultural environment that we're living in where increasingly the media that we consume has been either crafted or modulated or optimized to induce some kind of response that's specific to each person who's using it mm. and that is using some kind of feedback from that user whether that's a like button or some kind of biometric feedback to like further optimize engagement or ex extraction or, or whatever it is that you're wanting to optimize in that relation. 
how do we find an analog, a historical analog to what that kind of a media environment is? Like, what is it doing? What, what, and, you know, and I was thinking about PSYOP, you know, hmm. PSYOP operations historically can be very simple, you know, throwing leaflets out of the back of an airplane or incredibly elaborate and targeted like at one specific person and literally trying to create a world for them in order to get them to believe something that you want them to believe. That sounds a lot like social media right now. Bingo. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's, that's what I was thinking about. So the, the kind of centerpiece of the exhibition is a film that's called Dodie. And it's just yes. a very simply shot, you know, video installation. It's about an hour long. And it's just the guy talking. It's just him in black and white. There's no B-roll. It doesn't cut to anything. It's a kind of a feature of a guy named Richard Doty. And this is a guy who worked for Air Force Office of Special Investigations in the 1970s and 1980s, kind of PSYOP adjacent. What he did, he worked at an Air Force base in New Mexico called Kirtland Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. and this is a base where they were doing all kinds of weird experiments with lasers and stealth technology. And, you know, there's a big nuclear weapons research lab there. So doing weird stuff. As a part of that, people would see UFOs in the skies above this base. People would hear strange radio signals emanating from it. When you say UFO, you mean literally just something that's unidentified. Yeah, people would they see lights what in the sky doing yeah. stuff that shouldn't be doing or, or what have you. And so this um, Air Force Base kind of got on the radar of UFO organizations, people like MUFON or you know the Mutual UFO um, Investigation, but basically these amateur groups of people mm -hmm. study UFOs. So then what Rick started doing was running disinformation operations against UFO groups. So he would like recruit sources inside the UFO community and then give them fake documents that purported to explain the historical relationship that the US government had with like aliens and UFOs and that sort of thing. And these are very well-made documents, you know, top secret stamps and da da da. So these UFO researchers, then you got the idea like, oh, I have a source in the government who's like feeding me the <laughs> truth about UFOs and like, it's crazy. A lot of that kind of junk that he disseminated into that community became then part of the UFO lore mm. at that time mm -hmm. and became you know, really the outline of the plot of things like the X-Files, you know, like that X-Files really does come from these disinformation documents that like Rick Doty had disseminated into that world. Hmm. So that's his background. So in the film, he's talking about, first of all, how do you conduct these kind of psyops? Like what works, what doesn't, what is the craft of it, right? Hmm. What's the training that goes into it? Second, you know, how he did it, like, this is how you do it. This is how to make it convincing. This is, you know, he's talking about what he did. Then there's a flip and he says, okay, so my job was to create disinformation about UFOs, but in parallel to that, I was read into the real UFO program. And so he, oh, goes, on, <laughs> so he goes on this, like, everything I said is a lie, but this is the truth. Yeah, no, it's like really like the, you know, a kind of embodiment of the all Cretans are liars. You know, I'm mm, a Cretan, mm, you know, or, yeah, or, or yeah. Like, this sentence is a lie. You know, yeah, these kind yeah. of old paradoxes. Right. So then the, the film sort of is like going back and forth between the craft of PSYOP, the, you know, the his history of doing them and then like him telling you these UFO stories and you it's really difficult to calibrate yourself mm -hmm. like in that conversation with somebody by him and he can even explain to you why it's difficult to calibrate yourself in that conversation so he's a really interesting guy to talk to in that way and so the reason that I was interested in him in particular and this PSYOP in general is that it just felt a lot like chat GPT to me. It felt a lot like, <laughs> it felt a lot like AI. And it feels like, I felt like, like Rick Doty feels like a, 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 a seed of, of the future mm -hmm. of media. He's, well, yeah, I mean, as you're describing it, uh, I immediately call to mind people who are posting disinformation on, mm -hmm. you know, a Facebook message group or a forum or whatever. And there's uh, a craft to it. He, yeah. he even explains this craft in the film mm -hmm. where uh, it's good to begin with a fact 
and to end with a fact, mm -hmm. but to make a whole bunch of stuff up in the in the middle. So just to, to back up for a second, to be clear about what Doty's role was, yeah. is that there would be uh, private citizens organized in groups that are looking into UFOs. Mm -hmm. They would see something in the sky, mm -hmm. lights, unusual patterns, and so on. Mm -hmm. And they would think to themselves, this is the presence of aliens. Yeah. I have something on camera. I've detected something. We can't explain these radio signals, something like this. Mm -hmm. And then Doty's job was to infiltrate those groups mm -hmm. and tell them that, no, what you saw is definitely not military tech that's under development. It was aliens. Mm -hmm. It really was. And here's the proof. Here's a fraudulent document that I created that is the stamp of the U.S. government. But he's actually just misdirecting these groups from identifying what is actually ostensibly military technology that's in development. Mm -hmm. that some, something yeah, like that? Yeah, so that, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's layer one. That's layer one. But layer two. <laughs> layer two is, and this is, gets to the weird stuff, he says, like, well, sometimes they saw a real UFO and we got some pilot to find them and tell them that, no, it was a secret airplane that we were testing and that they yeah. would shut up about. So th this is where you get into this, Hall of Mirrors when you yeah. when you talk to him, and uh, he just, he's not posting on social media at this time. Is he using uh, cognitive warfare? Is he using memetics? Is he posting disinformation in forums, or is he doing like old school, you know, fax mailing documents and things like this? So at, at that time, it's old school. Like he'd literally, you know, have people come into his office at the Air Force Base, wow. say, "I'm going to show you some documents. Like you can take notes, but you can't take pictures." You know, mm -hmm. and, you know, have like, for example, journalists read the documents, or he would like give them to UFO researchers, and so it was very analog. Um, once the internet starts coming along in the 1990s, he's done this career shift to being like a UFO whistleblower, I guess, for yeah. lack of a better word. Yeah. And then he does start, you know, posting in comments and forums and that sort of thing. Starts accusing people of working for intelligence agencies and being, you know, running false flag operations, like really like the prototypes for the this other, you know, kind of hmm. internet hmm. cultural warfare that you see. Right. So prevalent these days. Yeah. yeah uh, just the other day, uh, just the other day, we were talking about there was a Pentagon organized anti-vax meme campaign deployed in the Philippines. And one would be curious why the United States would particularly care whether Filipinos got vaccinated. Um, it just so happens that, you know, China was giving them the vaccine, something called Sinovac. Uh, the Pentagon underwent a disinformation campaign trying to convince people that there was pork gelatin in the vaccines such that the Muslim population would not want to uh, get injected because it, that would be haram. Made all of these, you know, I've seen some of these military budgets are quite comprehensive. They need to hire a few graphic designers. These are, <laughs> these are not the best posts. Um, but what is, what is especially interesting about that is that the higher ups, the bureaucracy, told them to stop doing it. They did this against the wishes of their higher ups. Would you say that that's a common, that's a common aspect of a lot of these stories that now Doty is acting against what I imagine his superiors had told him, that people are kind of constantly pushing and pulling against the rules. And one is even tempted to imagine that uh, to reveal this information afterwards could be an extended part of the program. Perhaps it is to muddy the waters even further, to cast doubt on something that was indeed accidentally leaked, shouldn't be publicly known. And so now he discredits himself. And it's kind of, it's impossible to tell, you know, where, what is the objective of this? Where is this influence coming from? You know, it depends on who you talk to. Um, Dodi's antics had very bad consequences one of the targets of his influence operations like committed suicide partly as a result of you know the stress that he'd been put under Doty did a, a very targeted operation against a, a guy in particular who was a military contractor where he was doing stuff like setting up radios in his house and kind of looking like aliens had broken into the guy's house and this very elaborate, wow. Wow. high budget operations. Yeah. The guy ended up kind of going insane, committing suicide. There's a few other people like 
you know, journalists, you know, in particular that kind of cracked, you know, under that, um, in that environment that he had sort of facilitated where it was really impossible to know what was true and, and mm. what was false. And so I think at the end of the day, the, a lot of the work that Dodi had done became a little bit of a case study of like what not to do mm. when you're doing, you know, those kind of psyops. However, at the time, to what degree this was sanctioned, I don't really know. Mm. You know? Mm. It may be it may be Im impossible to know in some cases. I think it's impossible well. to know. I think it's impossible. To know. Do you have a sense of the world that that's going to lead us into? My sense is very dark, right? Um, for the reasons that you're, you know, suggesting, which is, I don't know what theory of democracy you have without some kind of consensus reality, even if we all acknowledge that that consensus reality is and always has been, you know, synthetic to right. one degree right. or another. But it does seem to me that the theory of democracy does rely on a faith in reason and rationality and faith in the idea of facts as a way yeah. to organize, you know, as the stuff that you organize with reason. Um, when both of those things are thrown out, I don't know what you end up with, but I don't think it's liberatory. Having said that, I do try to kind of eke out a bit of optimism. Um, the bit, uh, if, but again, I even hesitate to say this because I don't want to seem like a, you know, a, a booster of mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. technology or that sort of stuff. And I definitely, in the kind of economic environment that technology is embedded with into. I, I don't think that you can see radical forms of, you know, world building, you know, um, becoming possible. Like what we were talking about mm. with the zero point energy, you know, if, yeah, yeah. like, I don't know that you can have post scarcity within, you know, a, you know, capitalist mode of production, like mm -hmm. they're antithetical to each other. Mm -hmm. um, however, we, one must acknowledge that struggles for liberation in the past have always had a component of imaginative world building to them. Like in other words, you know, civil rights, you say like, we are people, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're expanding the definition of what, a, what the human is to include right. women, colonized mm -hmm. people, you know, people of color, et cetera, that sort of thing. And so there is a kind of imaginative reframing of reality that has, um, that has always been part of political struggles. It has not been, you know, the only part of those struggles, right? There was obviously nonviolent resistance and, you know, sometimes people taking up guns or having, you know, all kinds of, you know, act, acts of physical resistance. However, like that, that imagination of an imagination and imagining into different, you know, kinds of worlds has, has always been important there as well. So I don't want to, discount the fact that it is possible for like the imaginary or um, the, the creation of imaginary worlds to bring about real change. You know, I don't want to discount that, but, um, but I not, that's not where I see this going. I would say that it's, uh, it's too easy of a trap for people to just fall into everything AI related is terrible. Everything mm -hmm. technology related is terrible, mm -hmm. you know? And I was, I was brought up in a tradition of criticizing technology, criticizing capitalism. And, you know, it's very easy to get by and say, yeah. it's like, oh, everything that's happening is terrible mm -hmm. and uh, it's bad. And I will just not propose any solution yeah. or alternative. Yeah. And, um, you know, get a fancy teaching degree or, or whatever mm -hmm. else. You get, you actually get rewarded for having criticisms and not solutions in many cases. So, I mean, I think it's important to remember, to, to remind people from the left that the experiments, the very lineage that they come from, think of things like Cybersyn in Chile, mm -hmm. that the necessary component for 
planning economies, to remove markets and price systems and the, the fundamental mechanisms of capitalism, mm -hmm. our shortcoming has always been compute. Right. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. the Soviets literally uh, took pencil and paper mm -hmm. and tried to calculate shadow prices to allocate, you know, lumber to the east and steel to the west and all of this stuff. And it was just they were unable to solve Hayek's knowledge problem. Markets were actually more sophisticated, more complicated forms of crunching information. Mm -hmm. And they could derive price, which allocated resources mm -hmm. to where they were needed most, literally because it was a human calculator doing it with pen and pencil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the utopian dream of the left and socialists and critics of capitalism mm -hmm. was always to be able to offload that problem onto computers that had more, yeah. you know, more computational capacity than a human individual. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just see a direct line from cyber sin to the great irony of today, which mm -hmm. is that the venture capitalists of Silicon Valley are pouring boatloads of money into the tool that will create economic planning. Mm -hmm. it is, it's a real reality. Yeah. Um, I'm used to ma making the technical argument for mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. used to saying that it was like, well, we just need, you know, Cybersyn was the equivalent of a Game Boy. It wasn't a really serious experiment, mm -hmm. you know, the 1970s, whatever. We didn't have the same computation we have today. Mm -hmm. But there is also this kind of imaginative mm -hmm. component in that um, you need things to inspire people. You need something for people to believe in. They mm -hmm. have to be able to envision a future that's better than, yep. than today. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, especially important for mobilizing the political imagination. This yeah. is, you know, what Mark Fisher wrote in Capitalist Realism mm -hmm. is that it is our inability to imagine an alternative. Mm -hmm. And that has been the thing that has constrained the political left for, mm -hmm. for years and yeah. years at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but, but speaking of, speaking of capitalism, you've been talking about PSYOPs capitalism mm -hmm. in some of your uh, public lectures mm -hmm. at conferences and mm -hmm. at museums. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by PSYOPs capitalism? How does that anticipate the trend line that some of these tools are sending us in? Mm -hmm. So the way that I think about PSYOPs capitalism is the, it is about what happens when you take this cognitive tradition in media that we were kind of alluding to with MK Ultra and you know UFOs or whatever whatever it is you know when you're when you're taking a theory of media that assumes that the mind is the target right and you add the val the logic of extraction to that right mm. so i'm going to manipulate your mind and my goal is to extract value from you right so, you know, we have these older theories like the society of the spectacle as a theory of media and the surveillance. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pull information off of you and I'm going to package that and sell that. And that's my business model. Well, what if what happens in a media environment where I'm going to create media for you? I'm going to modulate that media to optimize whatever kind of response that I want you to have. And that's going to be a mechanism by which I'm going to extract value. Right. Right. And so. It's not surveillance, actually, right? Right. Because it's, I'm not about collecting the information from you. Like surveillance is a necessary component of it because I need that feedback from you in order to make my optimization better, mm. right? Mm. But I want to extract value from you. So we can think of these very simple examples where you would have like a digital avatar that's like your friend. You know, and they, you're talking to them every day. So they're developing a cognitive profile of you. Maybe there's a camera in there that's like tracking your facial movements and, you know, expressions, that sort of thing. So you're, 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 you have a profile. And then how is it going to extract value from you? Well, it could be as simple as saying, Oh, Josh, you know, your, your shoes look kind of shabby, but you know, there's, I, I know your style is <laughs> great pair of, I found for you on Amazon and you'd look really great in that. Or, or Josh, you've, you're, you're really, sluggish today i'm not really having fun talking to you we want you have a monster energy drink and we'll mm, kind of take mm. this conversation from there i mean those are super simple examples of that but you can ex imagine this expanding much wider so my ai girlfriend is going to be pushing amazon uh <laughs> prime purchases on me for example i mean that, that that's the 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 the, the most mid example i can right. kind of okay. think of this you know? but i think it could be far more you know insidious than that and mm. um and far more subtle you know, mm -hmm. and um, it does when you do have like generative media kind of combined with, you know, the, you know, affective computing or whatever, for, for lack of a better word, 
you there is a, a vision of a particular version of what we might call you know psyops capitalism or psyops media there um, but I think it could happen across all kinds of different domains, right? Mm -hmm. you can, insurance, real estate, you know, uh, what what have you? Insure, mm -hmm. yeah, you, insurance. You instill the fear in somebody; they'll pay for. That's for a, that's an invisible threat. Yeah, exactly. That's an yeah, invisible yeah. threat. You just need to convince someone that the risk exists, mm -hmm. and it actually never needs to happen. Yeah, and that's you combine that yeah. with where the insurance industry is going, where you. You know, in the past, you'd pay, you know, 200 bucks a month or whatever for your insurance. The, the way that they very explicitly talk about wanting to go with that is that, you know, you, with the sensors in your car, with your phone, what have you, your insurance is just being modulated minute by minute based on what kinds of decisions that you make. So wow. you get into your car, you say, I, I want to go to the grocery store and says, OK, here's the route that you should take. And you say, oh, well, I don't really want to go in that route. And they're like, OK, cool. But that's going to cost you like five cents more, you know, in the in this you know, yeah, kind of insurance. Yeah. Route. So you add that with this kind of, you know, manipulative media, you know, there's a whole party there. Right. And you can see yeah, this across yeah. many, many different domains. And so. You've got a kind of risk profile of the Philip K. Dick coin operated everything <laughs> exactly. where it's like, well, I'm going to walk on this street because my premiums are going to go up if I go on the one that has more traffic because someone got hit there a while ago. And it's just, yeah, you become um, completely financially incentivized to like avoid risk. And uh, maybe the most profitable way to exist under this kind of rentier model of psyops capitalism is probably just to eat the bugs and live in the pod and have your headset <laughs> on at all times and that's like that's yeah going outside is very expensive right? exactly. exactly and all my friends are in here they're all on the computer that's exactly and they're telling yeah, me to no. you know buy shoes on amazon and drink monster energy <laughs> drinks to keep up right? a little bit off topic here but Maybe we've touched on this just in enough places that we kind of have to address it. Is it at all a coincidence that both UFOs and AI are in the news at the exact same time with a lot of language around, you know, in the you know, legal language as well, of like non-human intelligence and things like this? Because when you describe UFOs as a meme, I take this to mean you know, a symbol that is contested between multiple people, it's highly transmittable because it means so many things to so many different groups. Mm -hmm. That makes it a great vehicle for someone who has a specific intent to implant those things on top of it. So is this, you know, coincidental that there's all of these, you know, declassified UFO conversations happening during the advent of AI and the boom of all of these tools like ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion and MidJourney and all of the, you know, fun stuff that we're seeing online. Um, are those things related in I mean, some they way? They feel very resonant with each other, you know, to me, you know, like looking at a thing that you have evidence of, whether that's with your eyes or with images that are made. Does it exist? Who knows? What, what does it signify? Who knows? You know, um, but is there is there something different going on here? Does it suggest something different about technology or about perception or about the fabric of reality itself than our everyday experiences seem to indicate? Mm -hmm. And so I think both AI and UFOs kind of pose those questions and pose those challenges to our, you know, kind of everyday experience. There's some kind of commonality of an intelligence uh, greater than humanity, mm -hmm. right? Greater than the sum total of humanity's technological achievements, which can either be in the kind of AI version, this like singularity that mm -hmm. is just an intelligence explosion. It, it's the smartest thing that is, um, you know, more capable than any human, even all the combined human populations It invents all of these things. Similarly, if we observe these UFOs and aliens do indeed exist, they must have so such incredibly advanced technology. We can't even comprehend it. There's this realization, almost a revelation where there's something greater than the human in either case. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a lot of parallels to to God. And mm -hmm. in fact, in some of these what they call shared hallucinations, which is a very difficult term where people claim to see UFOs, other people claim to see the Virgin Mary, right? There's some kind of, you know, crowds of thousands of people in some of these historical instances that are all claiming to see something, but something 
different based mm-hmm. on the uh, the different groups. Yeah, and this is um, you know mankind's kind of inarticulate way of grasping at the idea that there there is something greater than them. And we use these different narratives to kind of describe that phenomena to understand how it feels, you know, to be uh, to be small again. Absolutely. You know? And are those objects here to save us or to destroy us? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the I mean I have to I have to comment that the um, for divinity, for the revelation side of it, heaven is a post-scarcity environment. <laughs> uh, exactly. The UFOs have free energy, free boundless energy. Mm-hmm. They can, you know, Star Trek replicators, utopia. None of that is communism. Right. Oh, it's, none of that is <laughs> communism. But the AI thing is kind of similar. That yeah. like, okay, this thing's going to get so smart it's going to solve all of our problems. It's just, it's a runaway intelligence curve. Once it goes, it just keeps getting better. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of like cast aside all of the the worries, the material scarcity, the stresses of today by kind of offloading it onto this, you know, hope for a kind of utopian post-scarcity society that is, is basically trying to like indirectly solve the crises of capitalism, exactly. right? They're trying to eliminate scarcity without having a class project or any kind of like revolutionary notion or any semblance of a bourgeoisie and a proletariat right. or whatever. It's like, oh, we'll just like eliminate scarcity and then it's done. And right, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> with, with, with also ignoring the fact that even if post-scarcity technology was, was even if post-scarcity technology was invented in the context of capitalism, that it would not, be, you know, it would right. be. <laughs> right, yeah, we just have artificial scarcity, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. We just have rentism, rentism <laughs> exactly. forever, right. yeah, exactly. yeah. I can't think of any scenarios that resemble that now whatsoever. That's funny you mentioned that. <laughs> um, <laughs> How's your Adobe subscription going? That's it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> I actually, um, I shouldn't say this on the podcast. I pirated the software, so I canceled it, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do we extrapolate out these tools to lead to? You've been talking about this in some of your lectures at different museums and conferences, and you've used the term psyops capitalism. So I think, like, the artist Brandon Bandy, um, Jack Ricker... Um, Gonzeli Yelchinkaya from Dazed, and they, they've all kind of used this phrase, psyops realism, to try to, you know, say something or try to describe the aesthetic experience of, of living in an online world, which is so fraught with, you know, manipulation, suspicion, the kind of breakdown of a consensus reality. And what is the, ex- what is the aesthetic of that, mm. I guess, is what mm. they're all sort of trying to get at. Mm. A kind of uh, schizophrenic news feed where you feel like you're being emotionally pulled in a million directions at once. Uh, and someone is extracting something from you. Somebody's but you're not sure. <laughs> exactly. And somebody's <laughs> accusing or... you of like, running a false flag operation. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Where do you get your information from? You have a, an incredible archive library of, of books. Who are some notable people, resources to look into if people want to learn more on their own. You know, if you try to look at this stuff on the internet, you're going to find a very noisy space that has a lot of nonsense and conspiracy bullshit and whatever. So who are some of the writers that have uh, inspired and informed your views onto these topics? So I got really interested in like UFOs via a guy named Mark Pilkington, who wrote a book called Mirage Men, which... um, is a history of UFOs and disinformation. Um, he has a section about Doty as well. He, he did some work with Doty um, a while ago. And he, the argument that he makes is that from the get-go, you, the intelligence agencies have used UFOs as a means through which to conduct disinformation and psychological operations. Mm. So he's been a little bit of a, like a, a guide and, and a mentor to me in terms of thinking about that kind of thing. Um, my friend Aaron Gatch in the Bay Area runs a thing called the Center for Tactical Magic. And he's been a real guide in terms of wow. thinking through these questions about magic and what, how do you think about magic as a medium? How do you think about it? As a, as a as kind of operational media, for lack of a better word. And so he's been a, a tremendous resource as well in terms of thinking about that piece of it. 
I can't help but ask this. And I have um, people I really admire, you know, Jack Wagner, Daniel Keller, people who I consider to be experts on UFOs and all sorts of, you know, internet culture in general. Mm -hmm. What the hell are they trying to distract us from with all of the UFO stories that are coming out? <laughs> like I just I have not been able to solve that. No, but I, I think that's the that's the thing that that is the problem is that like when when you articulate it as a, like a question of distraction, you know, from something else, you're that's a mirror to this conversation of like what is real versus mm -hmm. what is not, and what if like the distraction itself is the point, right? It's like, okay, the instinct, it's tempting to say that democracy, liberal democracy is falling apart. Yeah. And so the government has uh, orchestrated this psychological operation in which now we all need to be talking about UFOs and there's all these leaks and whatever and news stories to distract us from the fact that liberal democracy is falling apart. But everybody knows it. It's like you can't hide it. It's just like it's all around us all the time. It's like I don't feel distracted. I was like, oh, liberal democracy is falling apart and there's UFOs. Okay, that's, that's it. So these feel, yeah, these, I don't, these feel like two sides of the same thing, not like a distraction from one right. to the other. Exactly. Right. exactly. No, I mean, I think that's where like the, you know, a lot of I was getting nervous when people bring like the CIA into it or like even PSYOPs as a, as a military mm. concept into it because it does assume this opposition between like the government and the people or like mm. it, or truth and falsity. And I don't, you know, in this Trump era, like the chaos is the point, right? And, right, the, and right. the chaos is the possibility of, of imagination at the mm. same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that those kind of binaristic ways of conceiving of the the metaphysics of this stuff are, are, are don't really work there's mm. something weirder going on we've been talking about where where all these things go um and kind of speculating out into the future which yeah. you know for for me as a young man as an intellectual as a creative what I valued most about the art world was being able to have conversations like this, mm -hmm. right? Where if you talk to someone who's in any specific discipline, like if they're an AI researcher, where I've talked to people who are AI researchers, uh, if you talk to someone who's from you know a specific field, like they're a, um, a disinformation researcher, they can kind of go so far, but like art is this one field that doesn't abide by the specific discipline of anything else. You can have these like really large conversations, you know, and you can leverage aesthetics and tech and politics and all this stuff. And it's very generative for creating images of the, of the future, you know, and that was always, that was what drew me to it. I just found it was like the most interesting place to be. And mm -hmm. uh, it was, yeah, those ideas have shaped my, my life and all of my decisions uh, uh, yeah. after. If we look back a little bit, we look back for um, the last few years, there does seem like there's a few things that are not just speculative, but were kind of decisive moments in which consensus reality started to disintegrate, mm -hmm. fall apart, um, rapidly or slowly. Mm -hmm. you, you might be able to interpret that. But do you have a sense of certain milestones that were, you know, important, important points in the timeline leading up to where we are now? Can you pinpoint a certain time when reality started to fracture the exodus I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's a long it's a long right, process right, right, exactly <laughs> no, well I that's mean, a that's a question that's, you know that's a question yeah. it's like are these things you know i i ask people sometimes it's like what does this go back to the 1980s does it go to the 1970s yeah. does it start in 2016 was it like this under feudalism? Was it, was, is this not even related to capitalism at all? And this is just a kind of phenomena of human society and culture, and maybe it's not political economy. You know, let's say we're living in utopia, 2040. We got uh, socialism, we're living in communism, just uh, post-scarcity, we actually achieved it. Utopia arrives. We're still going to have problems like people having heartbreak and tummy aches yeah. and all sorts of other things. Like, is this a core human problem of consensus reality? Mm -hmm. Or is this something that has been exacerbated by the media environment and the political economic circumstances? You know, this idea of consensus reality has always been synthetic, right? 
Um, it's it's always been manufactured to quote you know Chomsky's kind of mm. you know important text on this. I guess I would want to ask the question differently, and I don't have an answer for it, but maybe the way that I would frame the question would be more about when did the creation of and appeal to affects or, you know, kind of cognitive responses. What is the history of that sort of eclipsing appeals to reason, right? Mm. In, mm. Um, in, you know, in cultural discourse at a broad level. And maybe that has never happened. Maybe it, it, maybe it's always been appeals to emotion and appeals to, you know, cognitive manipulation. I'm thinking of something like, you know, Nixon Southern strategy is, right. you know, these kind of over mm -hmm. appeals to racism, for example, historically, mm -hmm. which has always been a part of American politics. What I take from your question is that it feels different now. And like, it feels different to me now too, Yeah, you know? I heard it put to me once by a friend that social media was primed to explode. There was going to be a political explosion, no matter who won and what happened, purely because the adoption curve of the growth of the platforms had saturated to everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody everybody was on it, so mm -hmm. something was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I look at 2012, mm -hmm. where we started to personalize uh, algorithmic news feeds, mm -hmm. and I believe 2011 is when Google started to personalize search results. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's been this incremental shift away, mm -hmm. um, and you know it's important that you know, fake news didn't start in 2016. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but in some ways, we are still living in that in that period. Mm -hmm. um, I think what is particularly interesting now, I'm going to try and wrap a few things together. But there is this kind of political economic subtext to all of this stuff. I think it's easier to be rational in a social democratic society. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to make a rational decision to go to work every day, to be on the assembly line when you reliably know that you can bring home mm -hmm. money and food and, um, you know, provide a house for your family to... Uh, not have the factory disappear overnight, mm -hmm. right? There's like reasonable decisions, mm -hmm. but the environment that we exist in now, the way to get rich or the way to not even get rich, just have upward mobility is to irrationally gamble on a shit coin in yeah. crypto, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's very difficult to be rational now, right? because we live in this society of, you know, finance capitalism, to yeah. use the word, where yeah. Enormous amounts of money, life-changing amounts of money move every day based on whims yeah. in very unpredictable yeah. fashions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is also where magic starts to come yeah. into it again. Yeah. Magic becomes a very compelling belief system because if you had the long decimal point that perfectly predicts everything and you have all these nano-trading algorithms, the thing that actually now decisively moves the value is the very unpredictable nature of it, yeah. meaning it's those random whims that often one very powerful person makes based on how they're feeling that day. Yeah. So um, one might make the argument, mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit silly to say, but it may be the rational thing now to behave irrationally mm -hmm. for your own survival. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you go and enlist in the workforce, you're going to be in poverty. Yeah. You're yeah. going to be in right. the Amazon fulfillment center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's not those middle class jobs that sustained people during the times where we had a relatively more constrained idea of what consensus reality was. Mm -hmm. That you know there were people you know. In, my own family, like one parent is a Republican, one parent is a Democrat, and they agreed on enough stuff that it didn't cause them to become divorced or break down reality. And now people like, oh, I kicked my uncle out of Thanksgiving dinner. I don't talk to him anymore because they just have completely irreconcilable worldviews. Yeah. So within the framework of finance capitalism, very difficult to be uh, a rational person mm -hmm. again. And these magical belief systems, things like hyperstition, mm -hmm. things like generating hype, um, are actually rewarded yeah. through serious amounts of value. 
yeah. serious amounts of value. People believe a thing is yeah. valuable. The power of that belief is transmittable as a meme, and thus it does indeed have value. Yeah. And you can get real stuff with it. Yeah. Like yeah. you take that money out of the out, out of crypto, like it's real money. Yeah. The stock is real money. It doesn't have yeah. to be crypto. The stock that you're holding is real money. Yeah. And you get your you know food, clothing, shelter, all the necessary goods for survival. And if you took that rational approach, mm -hmm. you're peeing in a bucket in Amazon. There's no upward mobility. Things are actually getting worse for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, it's very, it's very difficult. And imagining, to summarize all of this, yeah. imagining a future in which you can have democracy mm -hmm. without anyone in society being rational mm -hmm. is extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah. And all of these trend lines just point towards further and further hyperbole, irrationality, more siloed worldviews, less consensus reality. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that some of the people who are designing these tools um, may be ideologically opposed to democracy. Yeah. And they may be attempting to build technical infrastructure yeah. which would prevent democracy from happening at all. Yeah. Such yeah. that we elect an AI dictator, which people will literally say. Yeah. They will literally fucking say that. Yeah. And it's like, well, democracy has just been such a problem that we really need to do away with this human decision making. And we'll just have like a God that determines, you know, where the shortages are. And I hope to God that I'm not the, you know, <laughs> the expendable externality in like who gets to starve this month, you know. I'd really like to have a uh, democratic input onto that process. But um, yeah, it's just, a, it's a very, it's a very ironic moment where the, um, in the strident techno libertarianism of a lot of the people building these tools is to create a more brutal dictator than Stalin could ever hope to be. Right. <laughs> so that is the great irony at the end of the end of history with yeah. no political model and seemingly no rationality or hope for democracy left in society. It's a right. rather dire, dire circumstances. Yeah. So I love, I love this framing of PSYOPs capitalism. Um, I have just such deep admiration for your work. You are one of my favorite artists from when I was a, a student. And even now you're one of my favorite artists. You've inspired a lot of my stuff. I would not be able to do what I do unless you had done what you did and my students and do not research, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing unless you had done it mm. first. Well, the feeling is, is very mutual and I'm like super inspired by the work that you do, super inspired by the community that you've built, the conversations that you've been able to facilitate. I wish that that existed <laughs> <laughs> when I was younger because I think you know, you're, you're doing so much to cultivate a space and you know really conduct conversations that honestly i see happening less and less in the kind of traditional art world as it becomes subject to these same kinds of precarity that that, that you've been outlining in other sectors as well you know yeah yeah we didn't even really talk uh so much about art which is you know how we know each other and what we share the most but uh we also love to talk about this stuff too but i would i would just absolutely share that sentiment that i guess the things that got me interested in the art world um you know the art world itself is a moving target and those things have remained constant but the art world has kind of shifted to be somewhere else so mm -hmm. uh we find ourselves doing this kind of conversation and i couldn't think of a better person to be in conversation with so trevor thank you so much thank for you. coming on the podcast it's just a, a wonderful experience to thank talk you to. so much josh really awesome to talk to you as always